want to uh, belong. We, we all crave relevance. We, we all seek purpose. And, and we fill our lives with, with more. We chase more money, more friends, more experience, more, more, more stuff. We, we hope in institutions, in sporting icons, in, in technology and, and, and fame. And, and, and perhaps what we need is, is less about more and more about less. In seeking one thing, then everything else can fall into place. You know, we pursue the one who never fails, Fix, fixing our eyes on what lasts and putting first things first, which is what our brand new series is all about, first things. that uh, We're talking about, really, in this series, the order of life. I don't know whether you've ever been to a, a restaurant and, and you've got something different uh, that, than what you ordered when the, 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 the waiter or the waitress uh, came to you you, you. you you know, just as you look at what's on the table, it's, you know it's not what you ordered. You know, you, you got the linguine instead of the meatballs. So it was the right consonant, just the wrong country sort of thing. Uh, have you ever been in one of those moments in life when what's happening in front of you, what's on your plate in life is not what you really ordered? Uh, the, 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 what you experienced is not the thing that you hoped for, the thing you expected, the, the thing that you wanted. Mm. And the truth is, in life, we don't get to order things like we do in a restaurant, so, like courses and dishes. Um, what we get in life has to do with the choices and the values and, and the decisions that we make. And oftentimes, it's not just a one-time decision. It's the thousands of decisions that we make that lead to what it is that we're experiencing in, in a moment. Sociologists tell us that, that we make on average 35,000 decisions a day. And no wonder we're exhausted. No wonder we're tired. That's a lot, isn't it? It is a lot. Sometimes it feels like more, actually. Uh, but, but, but we're exhausted we're because of the lives that we live and the many decisions that we have to make. And I often wonder whether or not the most spiritual thing that we can do is to make decisions because we make decisions every single day and 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 while we don't get to choose like a dish in a restaurant we, we do get to make choices that, that, that lead to the lives that we live we get to make those decisions every single day and, and we believe that there is one decision when it comes to the order the rhythm of our lives that we do get to make every single day and that decision it is are we going to put first things first. Now, when we think about what we're experiencing in, in life, um, how many of us, honestly, how many of us really think, you know, I, I'm not where I want to be. This is not what I was expecting. You know, you know I, I'm not doing what I felt called to do. You know, in those moments, we can't change everything, but we can change one thing. We can make that decision to put first things first. And so our hope for us in this series, I think, is that, that, that this could be a season during Lent where we perhaps, if we need to, slow down, perhaps look at the gauges of our life, you know, examine our hearts, do a little bit of reflection so that we can see where we're hurried or where we're worried. Because when we get overwhelmed, as we do from time to time, then we can get stressed out. So we just hope that we'll just look at the gauges of our lives and ask, are we pudding? first things first. Because um, certainly what I found um, in, in life is that sometimes God will allow us to experience the low points in life to help us learn things that we couldn't learn any other way. I, I remember years ago, we, we used to be involved in a project out in Africa, in Kenya, which meant that from time to time we'd find ourselves in Nairobi. And I remember one after one week of teaching, um, coming back to Nairobi and meeting people in what, what was the Anglican guest house in Nairobi. And I'd gone there to um, um, meet some people, to, to, to pray with some people, but got a, a little bit distracted in that place and spent too long there, if I'm being really honest. Uh, and the hosts of the trip had said that they would meet me at the airport to say farewell to me. And what happened was I, I was late leaving the guest house. I knew that we were late for the airport and, um, and 
Getting from one side of Nairobi to another is a nightmare, especially in rush hour. And I realized that we were in real trouble trying to get from one side of Nairobi to the other. And so I was pleading with the taxi driver to go faster and faster, but it's really hard to go fast when there's just traffic jams. And at times you'd be up on the pavement trying to get past people, get around. It's one of those really, really stressful, stressful trips as he was honking his horn, he was shouting out of his window and I was offering more money for him to go faster. And, and that experience actually just represented in many ways the manicness of my life in that season. And we got through the outer security of the airport onto the inside where I thought it would be a free run and the car ran out of fuel mm. and I was already a mate and I just got my bag and I ran as fast as my little legs could carry me to this place where I thought I was going to meet the hosts who were packing up and getting ready to go and I was embarrassed mm. and I felt like because I had to get in through to the plane that I, I was doing the walk of shame which I was and I remember reading years ago that, that, that somebody who said, you can't humiliate a truly humble man. And I realized in that moment, I was not really humble because I was really humiliated. And for me, the moral of that story was, you know, you know we can get so busy doing good things or, you know, or, or what we think are important things or urgent things that we can end up missing the best thing. That it's very easy, isn't it, for us in life to get so distracted that we don't realize the lights that are going off on the dashboard of our lives and that we need to thin up. We have all these kinds of intentions in life, but if we get the order wrong, uh, then we don't get to where we want to be or where we're meant to be. So we're talking about first things first. And that phrase uh, comes from the author Stephen Covey, who wrote Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, who I think got it from Peter Drucker, who wrote a book called The Executive um, e Effective Executive. But I believe that it's a concept that they all borrowed from Jesus. And we find it in his first message, the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 6 and 7, which is the greatest teaching in the world. And Dallas Willard tells us that Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount answers these fundamental questions that humanity asks, like, you know, what is a good life? Or what does it mean to be a good person? Mm -hmm. And in this message, Jesus teaches about the kingdom of God. He teaches about the, the, the rule and reign of God, the peace and the presence of God, how, can, how we can live with a certain kind of character and communion in connection with God, how we can experience life with God. And, and it's a life that's only possible through the power of the Holy Spirit. And, and, and in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus, he starts talking about things like um, worry and money and anxiety, things that, of course, are completely irrelevant today. <laughs> so we thought that we would um, have a look at the Sermon on the Mount and we would read a little section of it. And I'm going to read it to us now. And um, it comes from Matthew 6, 25, and it goes like this. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or stir away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They don't labour or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendour was dressed like one of these. If that is how uh, God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will not he much more clothe you, clothe us, you of little faith? So don't worry saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will, take, will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And Jesus, in this message, says, look at the birds look at the flowers. The thing is, do we take time to look at the birds and the flowers? And 
the subtle changes in the seasons and creation. And instead, maybe we're looking at our watches and our calendars and our apps and whatever else it is that distracts us. We look at all these things. And Jesus is saying, look at the things that the Father has made. If we just take time to pull back and take a look around us and look at the birds and the flowers and the beauty of creation, then maybe we'd see things from a different perspective. And remember that he is the maker, that he is the creator, the one who has made us and knows us fully and fashioned and formed us in his image. And that we have, we really do have a father who cares for us, a father who will take care of us. So what's he saying? He's saying, just take a step back and look at all these things that I have created. And remember that I am your good father. And that just as he cares for the universe, he will care for us. He is transcendent. He's above all, but he's also intimate and his love and his care um, in his love and his care. And he will care for us. Do we believe this? Do we really believe this? Uh, that he'll care for us? That he, you know, do I believe that he'll care for me? Really, do I trust him? And maybe that's a question um, that we have to ask ourselves this morning. Do I trust him to care for me? I don't know if you've ever been worried or anxious about something and um, somebody says to you, you know, don't worry about it. It's going to be OK. It's all going to be OK. And, um, you know, don't worry about it. And of course, it depends on who it is who's saying it to you. Maybe your neighbour, you know, you're you're paying rent and you're and it's difficult that month, and your neighbour says to you, "It's okay, you don't need to worry about that." And that's one thing. But then maybe your landlord is able to say to you, "It's okay, don't worry." And it's very different, isn't it? And it's a bit like God, who is the landlord of the universe, and He tells us, "Don't worry." He says, "Your Father will take care of you." I love this. This is Jesus, the eternal one, the sovereign one. He's over all creation. And he looks at you and me today and he says, don't worry. He stepped out of heaven to come to earth to communicate a message to us, which is don't worry. Because he knows, he knows our struggles and he knows what we're going, um, we're going through. And he, he doesn't want us to worry. And Corrie Ten Boom says this, she defines worry this way. Worry is a cycle of inefficient thoughts whirling around a centre of fear. It feels like that, doesn't it, sometimes? She was a young girl, as we know, who grew up in the Netherlands and her family hid uh, the Jews from the Nazis and they were found out and she was taken to a concentration camp and she was tortured for, and lived there for many years and she experienced some horrific conditions and listen to what she says about worry. Worry doesn't empty tomorrow of its sorrow. It empties today of its strength. Mm. Jesus says, don't worry, because he knows what it costs us. But it's a struggle, isn't it? I, I don't struggle with worry. <laughs> I can do it anytime I want, to be honest. It's very easy for me. Uh, to worry. Um, I don't necessarily call it worry, actually. Leaders have different names for something like worry or anxiety. Uh, we can call it contingency planning because it makes us feel better about ourselves, uh, you know. But where we look into the future and see potentially what could go wrong. And, and you know, one of the reasons I might struggle with worry is because I love what we do. We, 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 I love leading this church with Carrie. And I want us to thrive. I want us to do well. Um, and it's, it's one thing to plan and to pray and to strategize with a group of people, the trustees or the leadership team, you know, and to navigate um, uh, t together. But it, it's, it's different when it's two o'clock in the morning. And, and I'm wondering, you know, uh, what happens if people don't respond to Vision Sunday? What about cash flow? What about economic uncertainties? What about inflation? What about the staff and their families? You know, how about team unity or missional effectiveness or expansion, multiplication, cultural issues that we have to wrestle with in the day? You know, people in the church who 
who have surgery coming up, people who've lost loved ones, you know, somebody else who's lost a job. You know, I worry, mm. I worry about all those, mm. all those things. I, we can worry about our family, can't we? Our children, their spouses, our precious grandchildren, parents, you know, we can worry, I can worry all the time. Some people say to me, Mark, particularly in the light of last vision of Sunday, interesting emphasis on, on prayer. You know, why such an emphasis on prayer? You know, why do you pray? And mm. well, if I didn't pray, I'd be like I was, stuck in the car, in traffic in Nairobi, doing no miles an hour, knowing I'm late for a meeting and my heart is beating at 65 miles an hour. I, I pray because I'm a desperate man at times. Mm. And I think that desperation is the language of, uh, of the kingdom, actually. I'm desperate for God. And, and, and what I found in life with the passing of time is that I can either worry about it or I can pray about it. And so prayer is my preferred option. In fact, I love it. In, in the scriptures, in 1 Peter 5, it says this, give all of your worries and your cares to God because he cares for you. And, and so prayer is the only option I have really in those moments but because I do have cares, I do have worries, I do have anxieties. And God is saying, Mark, I want you to give those things to me. Mm. And, and listen, if it matters to you, then it matters to God. And God's saying, I want you to bring those cares to me. And here's an idea. What about a worry journal? What about a care journal where you're able to write down what you are worried about? Maybe when we've just had a hard time getting something off our minds and just um, being able to put something down on paper reminds us, doesn't it, that um, it's in God's hands. And, and maybe in some sort of prophetic way, you can, we can transfer what is maybe in our account into God's account. Mm. You'll be amazed to look back and see what God um, has done. You know, sometimes and many of us already do this, I know, but it, maybe it's a maybe it's something we could start this Lent, where we write things down and see what God does, and 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 look back on answers. Maybe even tick things off. Could be a friend who you know has been diagnosed with cancer. Maybe decisions that need to be made. Maybe. Um, you know, struggles that we're sort of processing that we almost need to log as we, as we, as we process. Maybe it's a daughter-in-law's infected finger, mm. which um, at last is free of infection. Yes. It's better. And we'll find ourselves marking things off. Thank you, God. Thank you that that is resolved. And even the things that are unresolved, we're going to come back. We're going to, we, you know, we can go back and remind ourselves that God has them. God has this. And that we have a father in heaven who knows that he cares, that he, our concerns are his and he does care for us. Um, actually, I've discovered in my life that, you know, and I'm a worrier, that the more I give God my cares, the more he takes care of them. And the more that I surrender to God, the more um, carefree I can be. And proactively, I've been able to learn to pass my cares on to him. And there have been moments in my family or with friends or um, all sorts of different moments where maybe my worry, and it's easy for this, um, might take over the situation so that maybe I've sort of been with people, but I haven't really been there. And, you know, I've been pre pre preoccupied. And that's what worry does, isn't it? It takes out, um, it takes us out of the moment. Um, yeah, it takes us out of that moment and it, and it takes us, um, or, you know, we're not part of it. And actually we're not really living life. And there are moments when um, we, you know, we can look back and think, I, you know, I didn't, I wasn't really able to enjoy that. I wasn't really able to be fully present because of my worry. Mm. And a full life comes from being fully present. And the surrender to a father in heaven who cares for us is the only way that we can begin to be fully present. 
So in this passage that Jesus gives us, there are some truths, aren't there, that we can take and begin to put into practice in our lives to help us to be fully present. And the first is priority. And the second is simplicity. So the first thing that we can start doing, first things first, and the second thing that we can stop doing. First, we start putting things first with our priorities. So I don't know about you, but even just in this context of worship, when we worship, we're able to align ourselves, aren't we, with, with God. We're able to turn our attention to him. And have you noticed in that moment the experience of peace? Um, and do you know why that is? It's because we are, we're somehow aligning ourselves, uh, we're aligning our inner reality with the reality of God, the reality of the universe. We're, we're aligning our life with what is true of the universe. God, um, God is it, God is God of the universe. The, we're talking about the reality of God and his bigness. Because what is true of the universe is that he is supreme. Jesus is supreme, that he's king. Mm. He's Lord of lords mm. and he's overall. And somehow in the context of worship, we're realigning ourselves with that fact. Um, and what happens is that when... Um, uh, when the one of the universe becomes first, things, other things fall into order, don't they? Because there's an alignment and what's going on in our hearts is what is true of uh, what God says about the order of the universe. And see, um, Jesus is, he's first, he's first. So whether he's first in our life or not, um, when he becomes first in our hearts, we can experience something in a whole new way and we can experience a different kind of uh, peace because we're living under his care, under his kingdom where he is king. We experience peace. And so that's just one expression of what Jesus is saying when he says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. God is going to take care of us. He's going to give us what we need. Um, and I don't, you know, have, being given what we need is different to what we want. And sometimes if we were given everything we wanted, we, you know, we'd be crushed, wouldn't we? But actually he does say that he will give us what we need spiritually, physically, emotionally, relationally. God will give us what we need. And it comes from the order of seeking him first, and that's priority. And when we seek other, thi other things first, we forfeit that peace. When we focus on other things, we forfeit the peace that God wants to give us. And actually, that's what Jesus is saying when he's saying that the, the pagans run after other things. People who didn't know God, they were running after all the other things that they thought might um, give them that sort of protection and provision and fertility and food. And um, actually, we're guilty of that, aren't we? Isn't that something that we also do? But Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God, seek first the king, and all these things will be added. He's your father and he will take care of you. And so this goes back to priorities. Priorities. No. Mm. So Question, how do we prioritize? <laughs> we, we can have this conversation between ourselves on a regular basis, but you know, sometimes we think of priorities as though they're a list, like it's sort of God first, family second, third work, you know, fourth might be family or mm -hmm. friends or dating relationships or yeah. exercise or whatever, you know, but we think about the, the, a list as priorities. Well, well, well God first, yes, but, but I think we're, we're, we're meant to think about it in a different way because it's not just God first on a list and lots of things sort of following on, but it's like God first and family, mm. God first and work, mm. God first in school, you know, God first and friendships, God first and dating relationships, God first and money, mm. God first and weekend plans, as it were, that we put God first in everything. It's not just about compartmentalization, 
or, or having God first on a list, but, but God runs, he permeates through all these lists. I think that's what it means to have a God first kind of life. And Jesus is essentially saying that, that when we seek God first in every area of our lives, then we will see God's provision. And I know that some of us, you know, in significant moments in our lives, we have significant major decisions to make. You know, it may be that we're knotted up inside because of the decision process we're going through um, that we have to make. And, and God wants to lead us. He wants to bless us. It's in his heart always to bless and to show favour. And so we bring these areas to him and under him and we obey God because in the end, God can't bless disobedience. So we bring those things under his love and his, his care. I think that's what it means to seek first the kingdom of God. So, so just to be really practical, just for a moment, you know, what does first things first look like? Uh, what, what, what about first things first in our day? Um, you know, I, I, we want to encourage you to try, maybe this Lent, you know, but start this week. You know, b before you do anything else, if you don't already, spend time at the be beginning of the day focusing on God, whether, whether it's in prayer, opening up scripture, um, listening to, singing a worship song, wh where we just attune our hearts, as Karen was saying, align our hearts to what is most true in the universe, which is the supremacy of Jesus. Uh, you know, why do I say at the beginning of the day? Because you can't fill up at the end of the day. We fill up at the beginning. And so we allow ourselves to be filled up by God, by his peace, by his presence, and, and bringing, offering our lives, bringing our lives under his care as we remind ourselves of what is most true. It, it's so easy to do all the other things, isn't it? It's so easy just to get out the phone, go onto Instagram, go onto Facebook, you know, look at bank details, you know, do some work, get some emails out quickly. You know, actually you can do those things while you're still in bed really if you want to, or you can put first things first. And I think we're just saying, try it. We're just suggesting it really. Well, and you might say, well, what do we do with all that time? Well, I think we're a little less concerned about the mechanics of the moment as, as, as we are the order. You know, to just put first things first and see what happens in your heart. Spend your first cup of coffee or first cup of tea uh, with Jesus. It doesn't matter what you do with the second, third or fourth. That's a different conversation. But, but just the first cup of coffee, first cup of tea with Jesus at the beginning of the day. And secondly, uh, in priorities, I think it's first things first in our decisions. Uh, and I, I want to suggest a practice this week, this Lent, as it were, you know, uh, that, that we might all embrace. So when you walk into a room, ask this question, um, God, what, what do you want me to say? What do you want me to do? In a conversation with your spouse or with a friend or with children, you know, God, you know, um, what do you want me to say? What do you want me to do? In, if you're making a decision at work, God, what do you want me to say? What do you want me to do? I mean, anyone here, I know one or two folk particularly, but do you, have you ever lost your keys? You know, have you ever lost your car? You know, you just can't remember where you parked your car. Some of you are in here at the moment and you have no idea where your car's parked at the moment, okay? But, but one of the ways that people discover where their cars are now is that they have these little sort of car finders, these little buttons that they press and it sort of lets you know where the car is, you know? And when we do that, what are we doing? We're seeking our car. So if we want to seek the kingdom, if we want to go after the kingdom, it, it's a little bit like that. It's attuning our minds and our hearts to God and going, you know, what are you doing here? You know, what do you want me to do? You know, you know so, is it, so two simple questions to ask, you know, like it's kind of like pushing the button to find where the kingdom of God is at hand. Lord God, what do you want me to say? What do you want me to do? So that's first things first, you know, in our decisions. It, it, you know, it, it's, it, there are just a couple of ways that we can put priority into our lives. And the second is? The second is simplicity. Stop living more than one day at a time. That's difficult, isn't it? Our daughter Hannah has over her mirror in her bedroom a framed poster, a beautiful framed poster with beautiful calligraphied um, words. Keep life simple. I love that. Simplicity is about appreciating the small things in life. Simplicity is freedom from material desires, permission, if you like, to be, to be, simply be. Simplicity enables us to make 
good choices, choices that bring life. And Jesus says, again, I'm going to remind us, don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And I love the honesty of Jesus. It's like, today's going to be hard. You're going to experience hard things. There's going to be trouble in the day, but you don't have enough strength to deal with today's troubles and tomorrow's troubles all at the same time. So just trust me with tomorrow's struggles and live today. Eat the food that's nutritious. Don't clutter your life with too many things. Love the people in front of you. Focus on the moment. Love God first. People uh, we know who've been in recovery um, or some sort of, um, you know, uh, because of some sort of addiction would say this. They would say that long term sobriety has to do with focusing on that moment and being present in that moment, being, being in that moment and just taking it one day at a time. And um, in one sense, we're all in recovery, aren't we? We're in recovery from, we're in recovery from being in control. We're in recovery from living with fear. We're in recovery from um, making life too complex, from maybe compensatory behavior in some way. Maybe we've been addicted in some way to the certainty of life and knowing what's ahead of us. But Jesus says, I'm going to set you free and we're going to take it one day at a time. And um, just as we close today, I just want to read us something um, that Max Licardo uh, wrote. Um, and he gives us a great resolution for today in his book, um, Anxious for Nothing. And he actually closes his book with this resolve and I'm going to read it to us. Today, I will live today. Yesterday has passed. Tomorrow is not yet. I'm left with today. So today, I will live today. Relive yesterday? No, I will learn from it. I will seek mercy for it. I will take joy in it, but I won't live in it. The sun has set on yesterday. The sun has yet to rise on tomorrow. Worry about the future? To what gain? It, de it deserves a glance, nothing more. I can't change tomorrow until tomorrow. But today, I will live today. <clears throat> I will face today's challenges with today's strength. I will dance today's waltz with today's music. I will celebrate today's opportunities with today's hope. Jesus says, I just want you to live today. Sometimes we look at life and we see that what's in front of us is not what we ordered. And we can't change everything about that in a moment. But in a moment, we can change what's first. And that's the most important thing. We can put God first in that moment. He says, if you seek me first, I'll take care of all the other things. And he does that through our priorities and through simplicity. Amen. Amen. Why don't we, um, why don't we pray as we mm. draw this to a, a close and we're going to continue on this sort of journey of first things uh, during the whole season of Lent, taking us all the way up to um, Palm Sunday. But th th this, is, this is a season where we are given a gift of being able to reflect mm. and pondering and wondering about our relationship with the Lord and, 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 and what comes first in our lives. And so, Lord, we want to commit this moment into your hands. We want to thank you for the gift of this moment. And we want to pray that uh, through your spirit, you would just highlight any areas where we can be realigned with you. Mm. And perhaps where we might need to take the, the, our hands off the reins of controlling our lives and surrender afresh. 
to you in this moment and to put you first. Lord, we know that you're jealous for us. You long for all of our hearts, all of our minds, all of our souls, our bodies, Lord, to be surrendered to you and to be immersed in you. And in that place of surrender, Lord, we pray that you would come and give us a fresh resolve to live for you and to reflect you. When we pray that prayer, Lord, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to say? Lord, we pray that we'd have ears to hear and wills are submitted to you in obedience to you so that we can be positioned to reflect you as we receive you. Hmm. Hmm. We pray that you'd give us everything that we need for the journey of this week, Lord, that um, you would show us if, if, if the gauges of our hearts are running on red, Lord, and we're in trouble, Lord, if, if, if the petrol gauge, the fuel gauge of our lives is on empty and we need to be refilled with you, Lord, we pray that you'd come and fill us hmm. and refresh us and in palace. Mm. We pray that you would take us into all that lies ahead of us in this week. And so we pray, we ask that you would um, make your face to shine upon us, that you would give us your peace, that you would give us your grace, that you would give us your blessing. Mm. The blessing of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be upon each and every one of us, both today and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for being here. And we look forward to seeing you again next weekend. God bless. Have a good week.